Uh, so today we'll go through the 2018 uh, Depth in Chemistry paper. So the first question is uh, titration and starts off, gives us some information. Uh, first of all, it wants a definition uh, of a standard solution. So a standard solution is, of course, a solution of which we know the concentration. Sodium hydroxide is an alkali. What is meant by this term? Well, this is a nice question really from GCSE chemistry. Uh, an alkali, of course, releases hydroxide ions in solution. We then got um, some pictures of burette uh, readings there. And it wants us to tell the reading of each. I put that on the table there. Uh, just be careful. Uh, the last decimal place, uh, second decimal place, must either be a zero or a five. Um, and if it's a zero, you must put the zero so everything is to two decimal places, including the mean titer. The mean titer is, of course, uh, the mean of uh, titration two and titration three. Titration one uh, is too far out. Uh, to use your titers, they must, must be within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. Okay, then tells us the percentage uncertainty, and it wants us to work that out in titration 1. Um, I've got to times it by 2 because I take the reading twice. We do the final reading and the initial reading. Each time there is an error of 0.05, so we have to double that and divide it by the value times by 100. Um, how should the student have made up the solution? Um, well, we shouldn't have used a beak, of course. We should have used a 250 centimetre cubed volumetric flask. So now wants to work out the uh, calculation here for the titration. So we just whiz through that. Uh, first of all, you start off, you've been given a concentration and a volume of sodium hydroxide. So the first thing we'll do is work out the moles of sodium hydroxide. Um, it's told us it's a 1 to 2 reaction, so the moles of A in 27.30 centimetres cubed um, is 0 0.028 uh, divided by 2. Um, and now I need to scale that up to 250, so I divide it by the titer, uh, that tells us how many moles are in 1 centimetre cubed, times it by 250 which tells me how many moles are in 250, and then I need to find my molar mass here, which is mass divided by moles, which gives me 118. So I now want to work out uh, what A is. It tells us it's an organic acid and it contains two COOH groups. So I take away the molar mass of two COOH groups. That gives me 28. 28 is, of course, corresponding to two CH2 groups. So one possible structure is shown there. So on to question two now, we've got uh, a question wants to show the ionic bonding of sodium sulfide. Of course, sodium is going to lose its outer electron, it's a metal. Sulfur will gain two electrons and just make sure you show the electrons it's gained from sodium as being different from those with sulfur and fuel charges as well. Uh, so now the properties of sodium sulfide, sodium and sulfur. So first of all, it gives us some melting points here, which gives us some information, but we should really know what these structures are. Type of structure, sodium sulfide, of course, is going to be a giant ionic structure. Sodium is giant metallic, and sulfur is going to be simple molecular. Electrical conductivity of the solid, sodium sulfide, ionic as a solid, ions cannot move, so it's poor. Sodium um, as uh, both a solid and a liquid, it has to free delocalized electrons that can move, so it's good for both. Sulfur, no um, charge carriers, either the solid or the liquid, so it's poor for both. Sodium sulfide, as a liquid, it becomes a good uh, conductor of electricity because the ions can move when molten. Okay, so I've then completed the electronic configuration of the selenium atom. Um, should be quite straightforward. Selenium, sodium uh, selenide reacts with HCl to give a toxic gas with a molar mass of 81. What is that gas? We've looked at the periodic table, the molar mass of selenium is 79. Um, so take away 79, you're left with two from 81. Uh, so it's gonna be H2S, um, and I've given the equation there. Uh, so we're now using on to halogens. Uh, this first equation you will have known as being displacement of halogens. Very straightforward. Bromine is, of course, more reactive than iodine, so it will displace. 
um, iodine uh, and give me bromide ions. Why is that? Well, key things to note it is iodine, iodine has a larger atomic radius. It's a larger atom, of course. Um, it's going to have more shielding and therefore any attraction um, to an incoming electron is going to be less. Okay, it gives me an equation then. It wants me to show why this is disproportionation. Well, it's disproportionation because iodine is both oxidized and reduced. And I've shown that our iodine here is going to be in oxidation state zero. In hydrogen iodide, it's going to be minus one. And in HIO, oxygen is of course minus two. Hydrogen is plus one. So to get that to work, iodine must be plus one. Um, so iodine has gone from 0 to minus 1 and from 0 to plus 1. One disadvantage of using chlorine in drinking water is of course chlorine is toxic. So we're now going to look at hydrogen reacting with chlorine and we've got to work out the bond enthalpy of HCl. It's given me HH and ClCl, so I've done a HES cycle for this. Um, of course bond enthalpies uh, refer to breaking those bonds. So on this arrow here I am breaking the HH bond and CLCL bond to give me 679. This arrow here, I'm breaking two HCL bonds. And of course, the enthalpy change for the reaction is minus 184. Put that together, you can see that this arrow and this arrow are going clockwise, um, whereas this arrow here is going anti clockwise. So, um, anti clockwise must equal clockwise. So, you do your equation. Um, and you work out as HCl being 431.5 kilojoules per mole. Uh, so you, you probably haven't come across enthalpy change of vaporization, uh, but they've given you the definition. We will look at enthalpy change of vaporization at A2, uh, but the, you've just got to um, really work out what the equation is. It tells us it's bromine going to liquid to gas at its boiling point, so it shouldn't be too, too complicated to work that one out. Is it going to be exoendothermic? Well, you should know, really. You know, this is almost uh, key stage three chemistry in a way. Um, this is a change of state, liquid to gas, so it's going to be endothermic. Um, the A2 or the AS material really is the energy is required to break the London forces between the molecules. So, reaction of ammonia with oxygen to form nitrogen monoxide um, is shown below, and it's given me delta H for the reaction. That is, of course, a negative figure, so it's exothermic, um, and always only put single headed arrows on these diagrams, as I've shown, and because it's exothermic, the products are below the reactants. It then wants me to calculate the energy released when um, I do this reaction with 5.1 tonnes of ammonia. So first of all, you need to convert that into grams, which I've done there, times it by a million, and then convert it into moles by dividing by the molar mass of ammonia. Now, one mole, you then need to work out, for this reaction, you've got four moles of ammonia, giving you minus 905 kilojoules per mole. So to work out what one mole of ammonia will give, you need to divide that number by four, um, and then to work out uh, how many, uh, the energy that will be released when you uh, react this number of moles of ammonia, you need to times those two numbers together. Uh, right, so I put Kc for that reaction um, on the uh, answer sheet there. Uh, quite straightforward. Don't forget it's always square brackets because they're concentrations for Kc. Now it wants me to predict the conditions um, of temperature and pressure for the maximum yield in terms of Le Chatelier. Um, and then it also wants me to talk about the compromise conditions. So first of all, uh, you'll notice the reaction is exothermic. We've spoken about that. So um, forward reaction is exothermic um, and therefore to gain the highest yield, you would want to use a low temperature um, to push the reaction towards the right. Um, if you have a look at pressure, the left-hand side has fewer gas molecules um, and therefore you would also want to use a low pressure as well uh, to give the maximum yield. However, a low temperature and a low pressure would result in a slow rate of reaction um, and therefore you need to have a compromise of both. Um, why would you want to use a higher temperature and pressure for um, cost-wise? 
Well, uh, high pressure, co uh, high temperature and high pressure, of course, uh, both expensive to generate, to lose a lot of energy, um, and high pressure is also a safety risk. Okay, so um, they want me to, uh, they give me one bromobutane, it's an organic liquid, 1.102 degrees C, and a student prepares this by reacting butane 1 with sulfuric acid, and it gives me the equation. Student obtains a reaction mixture containing an organic layer and an aqueous layer. And notice the organic layer is denser than the aqueous layer. So draw a label diagram to show how you would set up the apparatus for preparation and then how I would obtain a pure sample. So I've given you the diagram for reflux air. Um, you need to really label your water in and water out. The fact you've got a round bottom flask and you are heating it. Um, and that should all uh, work okay. Then how are you going to purify it? Well, you're going to use a separating funnel to separate those layers and you're going to collect the lower organic layer because that's it's going to be the lower layer because it's got the higher density. Are you then going to draw, uh, dry that with an anhydrous salt, for example, magnesium sulfate, and then you would redistill the product and you would collect the fraction uh, distilling at 102 degrees C. So the student uses 0 0.150 mole of butan 1 ol and obtains 61.4% yield. What mass was obtained? Well, they need to work out how many moles of um, 1 bromo butane I'm going to get. So in order to do that, you times the moles of butan 1 ol that you started with by 61.4%. And then to convert that moles to mass, you times by the molar mass of 1 bromo uh, butane, which is 136.9% to give me 12.6 grams. Okay, so using the graph, calculate the rate of reaction. So um, I've taken the mark scheme graph and popped that there. So you can show the uh, tangent that they've drawn there at 30 minutes. And then you need to work out the gradient. So the gradient is of course going to be this distance divided by that distance there. And if you do that, you get it to be uh, 2.64 times 10 to the minus three. So moving on to some organic chemistry now, um, re reagents and conditions for reaction one. Reaction one of course is I'm adding H2O here, um, so I need to use steam and phosphoric acid catalyst. Uh, what is the name of compound D? Well compound D, first of all we've got two carbons, so it's ethane, um, and then you've got, you've got to do it in alphabetical order, and of course bromo comes before chloro, so you've got one, two, dibromo, 1,1-dichloroethane. One, one, Mechanism, well, of course, first of all, the electrons come out uh, of the double bond to go to that bromine, uh, the bromine-bromine bond breaks, and then that bromine attacks the carbocation there. Compound C forms an addition polymer, write the balanced equation. Uh, quite straightforward, don't forget your ends um, on either side of the equation. One advantage and one disadvantage of using combustion as a method for the disposal of waste polymer E. Um, well, an advantage is, of course, um, if you combust it, you can produce energy for, from it to produce electricity. A disadvantage, of course, is because it contains chlorine atoms, you could produce HCl, uh, which uh, could cause acid rain. Um, and obviously, uh, because it contains carbon as well, you would form carbon dioxide, which causes global warming. So finally then we're going to work out the structure of an organic compound. Uh, first of all, you're going to work out your uh, uh, empirical formula, which they've given you the percentage composition by mass. Um, and if you do that, you get C4H6O. Obviously you divide each of these by the uh, relative atomic mass and find the whole number ratio between them. Um, once you have a look at that, if you add all that up, four carbon, six hydrogens and oxygen, you get to 70. Uh, which is the same as the highest m over z value. So the empirical formula is the same as the molecular formula. You now need to work out the structure. Uh, and you've got to think about how many carbons and hydrogens you've got here. It has to be unsaturated. And how unsaturated is it? Well, you've got a, um, a carbonyl group in that. And also this line uh, here, 
for the M over Z is C3 H6 plus. So that would suggest you've got an aldehyde group like so. And then it says it's a trans isomer. So the double bond must be in the middle like so because otherwise you can't have a trans isomer. Um, and if it's trans, let's just redraw that again so you can see. I'm going to change that. So I've got my double bond like so and it's going to be trans. So I'm going to put my aldehyde group like so my H there, H there to show it's trans, and finally I've got my CH3 group like so.